Welcome back to the podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Mark McLaughlin, a neurosurgeon and the author of the recently released book, Cognitive Dominance, a brain surgeon's quest to outthink fear. Mark is founder of Princeton Brain and Spine Care, where he practices surgery. He is also a thought leader in performance enhancement and physician hospital relations. As a member of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, Mark has been a wrestling coach to Trenton Youth Wrestling Organization, dedicated to providing inner city boys and girls with skills gained through wrestling and working with mentors. Mark also delivers annual lectures on elite performance at the United States Military Academy and writes regularly for various popular magazines, including Business Insider. He was named a Castle Connolly top doctor for the last 10 consecutive years and an NJ Monthly top doc. Mark's book, Cognitive Dominance, offers insight into how to deal with acute anxiety and fear from a man who, it's safe to say, has skin in the game. With extensive experience in neurosurgery, Dr. McLaughlin has battled workloads and responsibilities that most of us can barely fathom. I'd recommend Mark's book, Cognitive Dominance, to anyone who wants to learn to deal with fear and anxiety in challenging situations. Dr. Mark McLaughlin, welcome to the podcast. Delighted to be here, Jax. Thanks for having me. So what got you into neurosurgery and led you to write in your book, Cognitive Dominance? Well, I knew I wanted to be a doctor ever since I was a little uh, boy. My grandfather was a doctor in Orange, New Jersey, and he was a general surgeon. And I just was, I idolized him. I used to follow him around on house calls and go to the hospital with him. So I knew I wanted to be a physician. Um, and then when I was in medical school, I had this amazing neuropathology neuroanatomy professor, Dr. John Pavlishak at uh, Medical College of Virginia, which is now v Virginia Commonwealth University. And he just was such an amazing teacher and the anatomy was just so beautiful. It was just amazing to see the infrastructure of the, of the brain and, this, and the neurons. And I just, I just was hooked. So uh, I started rotating on the neurosurgery service as a student. Um, and it was just like, it was like the Mount Everest of medicine, you know, there's so much to know and it was so challenging physically and mentally. Um, these were doctors who were, you know, staying in the hospital till midnight, most nights, getting home for a couple hours of sleep and coming back the next day and doing surgery. And it was just something that I, I just loved the excitement and the thrill of it. And, uh, it was, it was absolute calling for me. Wow. And can you define cognitive dominance for us? Sure. So I, I stumbled across this term when I was teaching at West Point. Um, I was I was invited to, to speak there uh, probably about a decade ago. And when I was invited, you know, the, the Center for Enhanced Performance, Dr. Nate Zinzer invited me and he said, just tell tell some stories about what happens in the operating room. Tell us about some some events that may have scared you, tell us about some events that were great successes and when you experienced flow, and then tell us about when you were, you know, having, when you were struggling. Um, and so as I began to describe those experiences to them, um, one of the cadets mentioned the word cognitive dominance, and I had never heard it before. And that's when they defined it for, to me as enhanced situational awareness that facilitates rapid and accurate decision-making under stressful conditions with limited decision-making time. And um, so it's a military term um, organically, but um, when I heard it, I thought, wow, and that's, that's, that's neurosurgery and that's medicine and that's life, isn't it? It's really trying yeah. to be, bring your best at every moment to try and know as much as you can before you make a decision. And uh, it's parenting, it's running a business and I wanted more of it. And, um, I've always said I'm, I'm not a master of cognitive dominance. I'm a student to this day. It's something that I think you can have more of or you can have less of. And it's something you can you can work on and you can you can hone and train it as a skill. And so once I heard it, I began studying it and uh, seeing the military applications. But also I kind of saw all of my experiences in neurosurgery in a different way. And I I I thought of basically sort of a system that helped me navigate fear and anxiety when I was encountering it during, during neurosurgery. And I found it was applicable to other areas of my life. And that's how the whole book uh, concept came about. Cool. I'll read a quote from your book. Fear is the anticipation of not performing to my highest standards, 
of harming someone because I was not properly prepared. For a surgeon, hurting your patients is the worst possible event for you, end quote. And a friend once said to you, if you're not nervous before an operation, there's something wrong with you, end quote. In order to take on your role as a surgeon, you had to discover a new way of interpreting fear. As I was writing my own book, The Artist's State of Mind, I found a new way of relating to anger during the creative process by defining it as a helpful signal that the unconscious mind is tapping at the door saying, I have a message for you. There's a different way of perceiving this situation. And once you've acknowledged that and seen the situation in that new way, the sense of anger or frustration disappears. The conclusion you came to regarding how to interpret fear was similarly to reinterpret it positively as a helpful signal. Can you elaborate on your, on your interpretation of what fear signifies for us? Yeah, that, that is spot on as far as um, uh, I think any powerful emotion and anger would be one of them uh, um, and fear another. Um, and so really what, what, what I say in the book and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's shelled out in the different stories is that um, fear is just the alarm bell. It's not what is actually going on. So it's not a fire. Don't worry about the alarm. Go ahead and take care of the things that are causing the alarm to go off. And so if you can create an awareness, um, oh, I'm feeling very strongly about this, um, then you can actually outthink it. And that's really sort of uh, the whole premise of the book is that um, when you experience when you experience fear, you need to sort of quantify it. Okay, I'm, I'm experiencing fear. What what level of is it, is it at right now? Is it just uh, anxiety? Uh, is it unease? Um, is it um, is it more terror, uh, or is it something uh, on a lesser scale? And once you can kind of quantify what level it's at, um, what I propose you do is you map it out, and you can you can literally map this out on an x and a y axis. The um, the understanding basically is that fear or some type of level of anxiety comes from something unknown. There's there's an event that has occurred uh, in front of you, or it's occurring as you as as it unfolds in front before your eyes, and you have to basically um, you have to understand that that unknown event is good is it can be an obstacle to where you want to go. So you're we're all on a path. We're on a path going from where we are to where we want to be, and along the way events come into our lives and they can either catapult us towards our goal or they can uh, di di divert us away from our goal or they can be something that's neutral that we need to kind of navigate on to, to, to move towards our goal. But every one of those unexpected events will give you a certain jolt of fear. So what I propose is that when you take that fear, map it out on an X and Y axis based upon two basic premises. One is what is the subjective component of that fear and what is the objective component of that fear or that event that's inducing the fear. So when I say objective, I mean, what are the characteristics that uh, no one would deny? What are the things that you could describe, you know, in Princeton, New Jersey, and someone in Stuttgart would say exactly the same thing about them? And, you know, that's, that's the universality of the objective. And then the, the, the subjective is, is really what is its meaning to you? Is it consistent with um, uh, something that you hold near and dear to your heart? Or is it inconsistent with that? And that's your Y axis. And, you know, um, you know performance enhancement coaches many times try to um, tell their, their, their clients or their athletes, you want to be in flow all the time. You want to be in flow. And the answer is, you can't always be in flow. In fact, you don't want to always be in flow. That would be a very, very uh, boring world after a while. And the fact of the matter is, is you need to have other events that happen that put you in some sort of a, a tailspin. So that makes you think in a different way. And then you need to have some events which really knock you down, which really take you to the deepest, darkest depths of your soul. And then you need other events that, that, um, could be positive or negative, and you need to outthink them and learn a new skill set. And so that's the whole concept of the X and Y axis. It creates four quadrants 
one of which is flow. That's when everything's objectively positive and everything's subjectively positive. You know, you um, you you get a, a, a job promotion in the, in the thing that you love and it moves you into a, a section of your business that you, you love even more, maybe being more creative and having a chance to manage people. And boom, then you, you're in the right spot and you're living, you're living, living large, you know. But then sometimes you get that job promotion and you realize your boss is your new boss is toxic and you're not in flow. You're actually in the calm before the storm and you need to figure a way to kind of get out of that quadrant. Or uh, sometimes you lose your job and now you not only you don't have a toxic boss, but you don't have work and you, you're, you're in the all is lost quadrant, that lower quadrant where the Y and the X are both negative. And then sometimes it's, you know, it's a transition and you're in a birthing a new skill set in the upper left-hand quadrant where it's partially positive and partially negative. And with those, you know, sometimes those are, those are events that happen to us that, you know, as we reflect on them, we say, that's the best thing that ever happened to me because it moved me to a new level and I was able to get back into flow. So all of those things are important to, to understand and recognize in our lives and not avoid them, but really to lean into them and embrace them. Yeah. Uh, so when you're doing preparing for surgery, uh, do you actually write these things down on paper or do you go through it in your head? Well, it depends if it's more of a like a cognitive issue. So sometimes I'll be worrying about a patient. I'll be thinking about what's going on and, and not everything's jiving. Maybe the films don't fit the picture. Patient's complaints don't exactly fit the MRI scan or... I've got a burning uh, sense that I might be missing something or there could be more to the story. In those instances, before the surgery, I will, I'll sit down and I'll write it out. You know, I'll write out, okay, what, what else can I do to think this through? And then I follow some of my rules of, of surgery, like never worry about a patient alone. Um, you know, uh, always leave a drain, never cut what you can't see. These are things that I learned during my residency that, you know, are sort of, you know, rules of the road that keep you out of trouble and save lives. Um, so I'll, I'll literally make a checklist. If I have somebody that I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going to talk to somebody, I'm talking to my, one of my colleagues about this patient. I'm going to re-image them tomorrow. I'm going to check another sodium level uh, tomorrow. I'm going to go back and look at my textbook at home tonight to just review exactly what's going on. So those are the kind of write them out things. In the OR, you need to have a mental checklist um, to go through. And the thing that sort of puts me on track is something called that I call my five P's. And that's when I'm, when I'm just before I'm about to start a surgery, I pause. I think about the, this exact patient. You know, this is a 42-year-old um, banker who uh, has severe radiating left leg pain. And he can't pick up his... Um, child anymore and uh, he's been suffering for three months and so i'm thinking about the patient and then i'm thinking about the plan what my plan is the steps of the surgery i'm going to position him i'm going to mark the skin i'm going to make the incision i'm going to come down on the bone i'm going to shave the bone i'm going to move the nerve away i'm going to take the disc out and then i'm going to dry up and i'm going to close and then i put out a positive thought and that is this is where you need to be this is your purpose in life um, be grateful of it be grateful for it and, um, and give him the very best that you can. And then lastly, I say a prayer. Um, so that's kind of what gets me set before my, before my surgery and kind of gets me on track. Now, sometimes you can get thrown off track. You can be struggling with the anatomy. You can, um, things can be not exactly as the way your mind had imagined them from the scan. And that's when you got to kind of go back to your basics, take a step back, um, look at the grosser picture, the bigger picture, move yourself down into the lower levels of the tissue and try to find generally one of the principles in surgery is start on the normal anatomy and then go to the abnormal anatomy. So that gives you your orientation. So as long as you stay oriented and then you find where the nerve is, everything else can be dissected. But the nerve is the number one thing you need to preserve. And, and that's how you go about doing your surgeries. So it's a mental, it's a mental checklist, but not as, not as deliberate as the, as the cognitive one. Okay. So would you say that, um, that defining the problem clearly is one of the main keys to establishing cognitive dominance? 
defining the problem and knowing what it is in relation to what your goals are. So sometimes I'll face a problem that I can't solve. You know, I've got a, I've got a, you know, a, a young man who has a terrible brain injury that um, I can't do anything for. I, uh, I can't save him. He's, he's going to die. And so that's something that um, I need to focus on. Um, okay, we've made a determination. There's nothing more that can be done. Um, now I need to focus my efforts on um, talking to this family, on preparing myself to talk to the family, on making sure that uh, this experience that they have is um, the least worst possible experience they could ever have. So that, that setting needs to be right. Um, the words that I choose need to be perfect. Um, the delivery of those words to the family needs to be perfect. Um, they need to not be left with some sense that they could have done something differently um, uh, because they're going to walk away with this conversation and they're, they're most likely never going to forget it. So it needs to be delivered like an operation, surgical with surgical precision. And, um, and those are the kinds of things that you, you sometimes need to do uh, to define what's going on. And for me, on the, on the bigger picture, on, the, on that X and Y axis, so subjectively, you know, sub, uh, objectively, it's a, it's a terribly negative thing um, to, to lose a patient. And, and, and subjectively, that's terrible too, because that's what I do. That's my profession. Um, so the only way I can, I can make myself um, assimilate that experience and, and find some meaning in it is to what I call climb the y-axis and do one thing that's consistent with my subjective goal, and that's to be the best doctor I can be. And if I can't be the best surgeon for this patient, I can certainly be the best doctor for his family, and I can deliver the best news that I can. So I'm, I'm moving up that subjective meaning to me, and that is to be the best person uh, to, to deliver the news, which is sad. Yeah, it's and, and it's wild. no fun. It's no fun, but I wouldn't let anybody else do it because that's got to be done the right way. Yeah. Another quote from your book, uh, we're trying to figure out a way to stop ourselves from putting all of our attention on the alarm bell and instead put our attention on the phenomenon that triggered the alarm. If fear is the fire alarm, the unexpected is the fire. Can you speak to this? Yeah. So that's what I talk about when, you know, the, I, I say, um, um, the unexpected is what you need to pay attention to. Uh, and the second you start paying attention to the unexpected, the fear alarm goes down because your, your mind is your, your limbic system or that crude or primitive part of your brain that, that visualizes threats, um, and visualizes them a lot quicker than you can based upon somebody's face or some sort of a feeling that you may have, or even a smell that you can, you can smell danger. Um, all of those things um, are, are they're, they're firing your neurons. And once your uh, neocortex, once your cerebral cortex and your frontal lobes begin to start thinking about it, the alarm bell dies down a little bit and you can start moving in the right direction. Um, if you don't start thinking about it, the alarm bell go, kicks up and then you get into this fear freakout loop where you, you become you. ineffective. Yeah. You become ineffective. And, um, and that can happen uh, sometimes even surgery. So sometimes there's, um, when, when I, whenever I feel something like that happen and when I get a, pro a problem that I feel like I'm not getting complete control over, I call my partner and I say, come on in, I need you, in, I need you in here right now. And they do the same for me. And it's, it's not often, but just getting another person in there and, and getting another set of hands and eyes can sometimes give you um, what you need to, to settle things down. And oftentimes they'll, They'll say the exact same things. They'll do the exact same things that I did, but I need to know that another person is thinking about it because you can lose your objectivity in in, in extreme stress and extreme anxiety. You can lose your objectivity, and you need to understand that, recognize that, and and lean on your team. Um, and, and so that's an important part of it. Um, but that's really what it is. So the moment you start thinking about the unexpected, you start analyzing it writing it down. What, what don't I, what don't I know? Sometimes it's, 
you know, something you didn't even know you didn't know. Um, and that's when you really start um, drilling down on what needs to get done. I see. Yeah. Uh, is, is effective self-talk a crucial aspect of high performance? Yes. Um, I, I truly believe that it is. I think um, you need to have mantras uh, that come from uh, yourself and from quotations from other people. I'm a huge believer in memorizing quotes. I have quotes lined up all over my weight room in my office. I look at them all the time. I have pictures of people that inspire me like Thomas Edison and Vasily Alexiev, the great weightlifter, Ernest Hemingway, Mark Twain, um, my, my father, my grandfather, my kids. Any, I have sort of like a green room in my office and it's people and pictures and quotes and poetry, all these um, different passages that uh, inspire me and I get mileage out of them. Some of them I get real, real mileage out of them. Yeah. And I, I truly think that that's, um, that's, you know, when we talk about standing on the shoulders of giants, that's, that's truly what it is. And um, it's interesting. I, I saw an interview of uh, Bruce Springsteen. Um, there were pictures of him. It was in, in a magazine when he was doing that Broadway show. And I saw his green room and he had pictures of all of his idols and all the people he looked up to all around his mirror, you know, and I could see he was channeling all of those people when he was getting ready to go perform. And I thought, yeah. man, if, if Bruce Springsteen does it, I got to do that too. And it's really helped me. It's really helped me. In fact, I even bring, I bring a little mini Dan Gable into the operating room with me. He's been sort of like my, uh, my little protective amulet and uh, he stays in my, my uh, light box. And that uh, yeah. was a gift from one of my partners. So I don't know for the listeners that don't know who Dan Gable is, he's one of the greatest uh, American wrestlers and um, he's just an inspirational guy and he's a co he was a coach at Iowa. And so I have Dan Gable in my corner, every, every operation. And um, cool. you know, he, he keeps me focused. Nice. What's the effect of having an established routine in your work? I think you're more likely to fall into flow or you're more likely to, to have a, have something that's, a, um, that's, the highest level of your performance. Um, it's um, surgery uh, is very step by step oriented. Um, you can't you can't go to C until you go through B, and and having that routine is very important. And sometimes if you struggle with C and you try to jump on to E instead of getting through C and D, you just you you veer off course very quickly. So I always try and make it a point to um, complete each step before I move to the next one. And um, having routines uh, and having things thought, of, thought out all the way through, um, very important part of, of uh, managing an emergency. So, um, you know, you, we have another saying in, in neurosurgery, and that is you don't want to be doing a lot of thinking in the operating room. You know, that, that happens before the OR. When you're in the OR, you rely on your reaction, your skills, your training, your routines uh, to get things done. Yeah. Which philosophers would you recommend for aiding the development of cognitive dominance and courage? I'm a big fan of William James. Um, uh, I loved his, um, his work on talking about the second wind that we can all have physically and mentally. Um, I think we can have second wins in our lives, even third wins. And um, his quote about some people don't even realize they go, some people don't work hard enough to get through their first win to realize they have a second wind has always been very inspiring for me. Yeah, that's um, cool. It's just a, just a wonderful concept. Yeah. Um, Descartes was a great, I just love Descartes. I love Descartes. Um, ability uh, to, to marry geometry and, and algebra together into, into really one concept. Um, I, I, I see that as a concept called consilience, which I think is, um, is mentioned Edward in Wilson, the book. Isn't it? Yes. Ed, Ed, yeah. What a, what a amazing mind um, Wilson is. Um, in fact, I just wrote him a letter um, I wrote him an email uh, a couple weeks ago because I've, I've read his book three or four times, Consilience. Yeah. And I just wrote a book, to, I just wrote an email saying, 
Uh, Dr. Wilson, I just want to let you know how, how profoundly your book has affected me. And um, I think it's just a, it's a, it's an amazing contribution to the universe. And, um, you know, I, I got a report back from his assistant. She said that he, he very much appreciated that. So he's still working away up at Harvard. Wow. That's 92 yeah, years 90. old. Oh, 92. 92. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the concept of consilience is, you know, kind of a jumping together of knowledge from different specialties, different ideas, yeah. kind of like Albert Einstein tying astronomy and physics, you know, together. Um, and I, I believe it's the same thing with the humanities and the sciences, <clears throat> turning the um, taking fear and taking making an analytical analytical diagram out of it, I think is a great way to kind of demystify it and to know where you are. Um, sometimes in our lives, we're going to be in those all is lost quadrants and that's okay. You, you need to be there sometimes. If you want to experience the ecstasy, you have to experience the agony, right? It's, it's the paradox of life. You need to have darkness to have light. You know, it's this, it's in order for, you know, we need heat and cold. It's, you can't experience one without the other. And so I truly think for, you know, meaning you have to also have despair and, um, you have to work through that. Yeah. You're an accomplished wrestler and you coach young people at wrestling as it provides a scaffold for the development of many life skills and character attributes, such as determination and others. I have an interest in late bloomers and the prospect of a person discovering new art forms and developing mastery later in life. Do you think it's possible for an older person, say a 35 year old to take up wrestling as a beginner and develop a high level of mastery? I think they could, I think that a, a person in their thirties could learn wrestling, um, a high level of mastery, hard to say. Um, I think I would say they could develop a mastery of themselves. They could learn moves. They could, they could execute moves. They could understand the concept of, of wrestling. And, and in a larger sense, you can, I think you can learn anything at any age. Um, I think it's a, it's a great, uh, mantra to believe. Uh, my father was an attorney for 40 years, 45 years. He retired and he went back to school and got a PhD in history and became a military historian. He wrote two books in his 80s. Um, he was not a writer. I mean, he was, a, he was an orator because he was an attorney, but he turned to military history and um, really focused, was always curious. I mean, I think the key is being curious in, in life. Um, I, I, I see examples of um, uh, people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s doing magnificent, uh, magnificent things. I mean, Ben Franklin, look at the productivity that he had in his 60s and 70s. Um, Ronald Reagan, um, uh, and, and, then, and then just the every, everyday ordinary person. Um, I, I read an interesting story about a woman up in Canada who got involved in, you know, protecting elderly people from cybersecurity. And she got interested in it further and went on to get her degree and PhD. And now she's, um, she's a, an advocate in the Canadian government and uh, protecting seniors from cyber, cyber attacks. Um, so I, I really do believe that, you know, you can learn any skill at any age. Wrestling does pose a particular um, physical challenge, maybe not at 35, but I don't think it'd be a good idea to take up wrestling at 70. Um, but you know, some Tai Chi physical motion absolutely would be a great thing for people who are older to take up. And I think it's a good, it's a, it's a good concept to believe in. And I think it's true. What I really love about wrestling is that it's sort of like a fear laboratory. Um, I have kids, you know, that, you know, that their first experience is to, you know, they train and then we get ready for a match. And I tell them, you know, when you step across that line, you know, that's you. You're the only person out there and you're responsible for everything that you do. And um, what I what I tell them in the practice room is, is that that's sort of the alchemy of wrestling, um, that if you can have the courage to step over that line and get in the circle and be just you and do the very best that you can, win, lose or draw, you're going to walk off that mat a different person. You're going to walk with a more confident step. You're going to have your shoulders back and you're going to know that you have some control 
over your life. It's your responsibility, your actions. And so I think it really is a great lesson, not just wrestling, but the martial arts, the one-on-one sports. I think it's a great lesson for kids to, for them to see, you know, what you put into something is what you get out. That, you know, when, when you're, you know, when you have a success, you know, it's due to your hard work. Um, and you know, you're responsible for things. And we, we live in such a, a victim culture where, uh, you know, so many, our music and the television and movies all, all portray people as victims. But I think the wrestling and the mixed martial arts, they, they do not portray a victim mentality, uh, in any, in any shape or form. It's you're responsible and it's yeah. a great lesson to learn. Any closing comments for those wanting to develop cognitive dominance as surgeons, firefighters, or in any other domain? Well, I would say, you know, start slow. Um, these these kinds of these kinds of concepts are they're hard to wrap your brain around sometimes. Um, but the awareness is really the first step, and so that's almost a mindfulness approach to, okay, I'm experiencing fear need to ask yourself, why am I experiencing fear? And what are the characteristics of this event that's dropped into my life that's causing this fear? What are the objective characteristics? What are the subjective characteristics? And if you can start just analyzing it, I think what you'll find is that your anxiety level goes down and your problem solving and lateral thinking goes up. And when your lateral thinking goes up, you can come up with novel solutions to problems that you may not have thought of before because your body is, your body and brain has moved out of survival mode and it's into more of a um, cognitive uh, creativity zone where you can really lay out all the options and then choose what's best for you. So I think a, a, a mindset of curiosity, um, a mindset that this is a... Um, this is a journey. This is not something that I'm going to just, it's going to click in my brain and I'm going to have it. It's not like the Highlander where you, you feel like you learned everything, you know it. I still, like I said, I'm, I'm a student studying this. Um, I recognize events that occur that induce fear in me. I map them out. I learn more about myself and the people around me. And it leads, leads me to a, a, a very meaningful life. Um, it's helped me really unpack some some senseless things that have that I've seen in my life and helped me make sense of them, and um, if you can embark on that journey, I think that you'll find the same that you'll make sense out of senseless things, which is which is my goal for the book. Wow, nice. Have you got any uh, websites or other organizations you want to uh, recommend to listeners? Sure. Um, my website is markmclaughlinmd.com. Um, I have a number of videos of other talks that I've given um, on the book and some, about some other topics about healthy living and longevity. Um, and I have a blog where I'll do some book reviews um, about interesting books and uh, upcoming events and current events. Uh, so those would be two re- uh, resources uh, for your readers if they wanted to learn more. Thanks for that. Okay, Dr. Mark McLaughlin, thank you for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you so much.